Despite the regular news updates around coronavirus, there are still some burning questions I know we all have about COVID-19. So I'm going to be putting the most frequently asked questions to some of the country's leading experts. Professor Kevin Fenton, Professor Catherine Noakes, and Professor Brooke Rogers. What's the difference between the original coronavirus strain that we knew to these new strains that we're now hearing about? The good news is that the viruses and the strains that we're most concerned about now, for example, the South African strain, these do not cause worse clinical symptoms, but we know that they cause and are much more transmissible. So they're much more easy to pass from person to person. Are there new symptoms, additional symptoms that we don't know about that we should be looking out for? Anybody who's concerned about coronavirus should look for a high temperature, a new or continuous cough, or a loss or change of your sense of smell or taste. And remember that nearly one in three of us, if we become infected with coronavirus, will have no symptoms at all. So it's really important both for people who may have symptoms to get tested and get tested early. I wanted to understand a bit more of the why behind the social distancing. That two meters, why is it important? The virus is in particles in your breath. Um, and when you breathe out, you breathe out some which are really big particles and they don't go very far. They, they land on the surfaces pretty close to you and some much smaller particles which can stay in the air for a longer period of time. But when you're close to somebody, you're exposed to more of them. So the closer you get, the more likely you are to be exposed to those particles if somebody's breathing them out. I know we're allowed to meet with one other person for exercise. So what about people that would say, well, if I can meet with one, what's the harm in another one? Why is it only one person that we can exercise with? It's as simple as the reducing the number of people who come into contact with each other because every time we meet somebody else there's more chance we can pass the virus on. Being able to meet with one person deals with, particularly for people who are on their own, the mental health challenges of, of being alone but it's a balance between that and the risk of transmitting the disease. What would be your advice for people who don't know how to stay motivated? I think that it's recognising that adhering means that we will be out of this situation and and that life will look more normal more like it used to if we adhere now for some people they may now be questioning well if the vaccine's rolling out and if there's so much testing in place why do i still have to comply to the rules we know that the vaccine even although it prevents an individual from becoming infected it may not necessarily prevent you from actually transmitting the virus itself. So it is important that even when you are vaccinated, you continue to practice all of those measures that can help to prevent the transmission of the virus. So there's lots of myths around face coverings. Why do we wear them and what's their purpose? So it comes down to those particles in your breath. Um, when you wear a face covering, if you're the person who's infected, your face covering can catch some of those particles and prevent us uh, them being transferred into the air where other people can breathe them in. So it's actually really important that we wear them and we wear ones that fit well to give us the best protection that we can. So does that mean if we are outside doing our exercise or, or wherever we find ourselves, should we be wearing a face covering outdoors? If you are in an environment outdoors where it, you get close to people and it's hard to distance, then actually, yeah, it is quite a good idea. So maybe if you're in a, a more crowded town centre or a market or you're in a supermarket queue, it's better to wear a face covering then. Why is it so critical that we do still remain in contact with loved ones and colleagues? The more isolated that you are from the world, the more difficult it can feel to, to reach out, to have those those more generic conversations as well as the deep ones. It's almost like we fall out of practice. If you're not connected or you know that others aren't connected, it can be about sending notes to people. We, we bake and take things to the neighbours. Well, we're enjoying the treats and we're forgetting to put them on doorsteps and just eating them all ourselves. So. <laughs> Many people are engaging with the social distancing and the face coverings. Is there anything else that you know us, the public, can do to keep ourselves safe? So one of the really important ones is about ventilation and keeping fresh air into your home or your workplace. Some of those particles that we breathe out, some of them are very, very small and they can stay in the air for a long period of time. Just a simple action of opening a window can flush some of those particles away. 
what can we do as parents and guardians to further support our children and young people? We have seen the impacts of COVID on our, on our children. And um, we're trying to think of different ways that we can create opportunities for them to socialize in a meaningful way, but also to let them know that it's okay for them to have different feelings about this and to give them hope that, you know, when we all get back together, we, we can hug one another, we, we can spend time with one another and we can celebrate being together again. So there we have it, your questions answered from those with the very best knowledge of the current restrictions. There is light at the end of the tunnel, but as we heard, it's vital for us all to keep following the guidance so that we can get back to normal as soon as possible. For all the latest coronavirus information, go to gov.uk forward slash coronavirus.